Project management concepts may seem tough at times, but not to worry. You have a coach who makes it as easy as ABC. Here he is to set things straight for you, your friend Phil. Hello my awesome project managers, how are you? Welcome to Pembok Gold. Last time we talked about the basics of project management. Today we're going to continue from where we left off. Now before we get into that, I want to remind you of what exactly we talked about last time. We talked about project management as being the management of projects by applying knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques. And I showed you some of the tricks of the trade, some of the tools, and I want to very rapidly go over those just to remind you a little bit about what we discussed. So the very first thing we talked about last time we met was the project charter. I showed you an example of the project charter and I stress to you that the project charter is meant to be a high level view of what exactly the project is meant to entail and in this project we are designing a new backpack for the market. It's a fictitious project and I showed you all sorts of other tools and techniques and templates and things such as that. In addition to this, I also showed you the stakeholder register and we talked about how the stakeholder register could be for individuals or entities as a whole such as entire organizations. So you might remember that I showed you this stakeholder register. And after we got done talking about the stakeholder register, I told you we were done with the high level view of initiating. And then we went into planning. We talked about planning the project. And the very first thing that I wanted to call your attention to was how requirements are collected. So I showed you a requirements traceability matrix. If you remember, I showed you this image and I talked about how this could be used to track requirements to their origin, to maintain requirements through their cycle of life, to make sure that if requirements are changing, we're actually taking note of those changes as the project moves along. I also told you that an auxiliary requirements collection document could be referred to as requirements documentation. It may be in a matrix format or it may not be in a matrix format. When we got done with that, collection of requirements, we went into the topic of the project scope statement. And if you remember, I told you that the project scope statement contains inclusions and exclusions. I also told you that the project scope statement could contain the project deliverable description. And in addition to this, we talk about the acceptance criteria for the product service or result. We also go through existing constraints and assumptions to make sure that they are complete and concise. Now bear in mind that constraints and assumptions live in the assumption log. When we got done talking about that, I went over to the work breakdown structure. So I showed you a WBS and I also showed you a WBS dictionary. I'm hoping that you can remember that. And we did get questions in about the WBS and the WBS dictionary. But let me show you a quick image here to refresh your memory. And WBS stands for Work Breakdown Structure. I showed you this one and I showed you how my colleague had broken this down into three levels. And after this, I showed you the WBS dictionary. And we had questions, like I said, about the WBS dictionary. But let me show it to you just to get you caught up to where we were last. I showed you this, the WBS dictionary, and um, we had a question about this. And um, I would like to take that question before we go any further. And the question states, this is from one of our friends on YouTube, it states, Hi Phil, do we estimate cost based on work packages or activities? That is a brilliant question and the answer is you could estimate cost based on anything. If you want to do it at the activity level, go ahead and do it. If you want to do it at the um, work package level, that is also doable. A lot of folks may not be aware that the PMI and the PMBOK guy, they give you a blank slate pretty much 
to use whatever you will. So let me take you there to chapter 7 in the Pembok Guide, page 240. It says, estimate cost is the process of developing an approximation of the cost of resources needed to complete project work. The key benefit of this process is that it determines the monetary resources for the project. This process is performed periodically through the project as needed, and it goes on and on. But if you go to page 241, it says, a cost estimate is a quantitative assessment of the likely cost of resources required to complete the activity. See, it is a prediction that is based on the information known at a given point in time. Cost estimates include the identification and consideration of costing alternatives to initiate and complete the project. Cost trade-offs and risks should be considered, such as make versus buy, buy versus lease, and the sharing of resources in order to achieve optimal cost for the project. So when you read this on the surface, it does look as though this is all about activities and nothing else. But if you mine a little bit deeper into the PMBOK guide and you read the definitions of things like bottom-up estimating and so on, you begin to find out some more. So let's let's read a little bit more just to, to get a clearer idea of what the PMI is saying here. So if you read bottom-up estimating, it says, bottom-up estimating is a method of estimating a component of work. The cost of individual work packages or activities. You see that? Work packages or activities is estimated to the greatest level of specified detail. The detail cost is then summarized or rolled up to higher levels for subsequent reporting and tracking purposes. The cost and accuracy of bottom-up cost estimating are typically influenced by the size or other attributes of the individual activity or work package. So you see the PMI is giving you either activity or work package. And if you read further, you begin to see that narrative of activity or work package. So while I would like to go down to the task level for all my estimates, in reality, that may not always be a feasible option. Not only because of time that is spent to do that, but the pragmatism of doing it, you know, to make it sensible and adaptable to business, you may just have to scale it up or down. Sometimes you even have to estimate at a much higher level. Nothing prohibits you from estimating at a control account level. Nothing. You see, one of the things you need to get straight about the PMBOK guide is it is a blank slate, a blank template for you to do whatever you want to when it comes to estimating, when it comes to scheduling, whatever makes sense to it. And recently, you know, the PMI talk about hybridization. You can come up with a hybrid approach. You could mix and meld this and anything else you want. So for the sake of the exam and in reality, I'll just say that you can very well estimate at whatever level is convenient and most sensible and pragmatic to whatever is at hand. Now, going back to our WBS dictionary, because it is also from this um, student that we got a follow-on question. And the follow-on question about this is, um, if the cost is based on activity, why is the activity list not an input to estimate cost. I'm coming back to that one. But it went further to say, I read that WBS Dictionary doesn't mention the names of resources, but only their discipline and how many resources are needed. While that could be looked at as true on some projects, nothing prohibits you from doing whatever you will. So the idea is, as you're putting together your WBS, you may not really know your resources that well, and you might have an idea of you know, a generic description, fine, but nothing prohibits you. You see, I think this is where I get a lot of pushback from people in the real world when I present this to them, because they feel that the PMI, this is what they feel, this is not what is, they feel that the PMI is giving them too many restrictions, that it has to be exactly like what it is in the PMBOK guide. No, no one said that. 
No one says it has to be exactly what it is in the PEMBOK guide. You know, another uh, dialogue is with regards to the resource management plan and the OBS. And there's this misconception that your OBS or your RBS should only have generic resources. No, it could be real people. If you know who is going to be or who you want on the project, or you've got an archetype, or your organization is so small that you got no one else anyway, wouldn't it make sense to just put those people in? You know. But anyway, let's go to where this is talked about, WBS Dictionary. So it says, the WBS Dictionary is a document that provides detailed deliverable activity and scheduling information about the about each component in the WBS. The WBS Dictionary is a document that supports the WBS. Most of the information included in the WBS Dictionary is created by other processes and added to this document at a later stage. Information in the WBS Dictionary may include, but it's not limited to. Now, you need to catch what came before that, right? It says it's created in other processes and added to this document at a later stage. Nothing prohibits you from updating where it says resources required. It could be generic or it could be otherwise. Nothing prohibits you. So talking about the pragmatism of this whole PMBOK guide thing, nothing should restrict you from using it as you see most appropriate. Most appropriate. For example, you're presenting information to management and you show them this and they can immediately see, okay, we know these names, we know who these people are, rather than saying coder, tester, trainer. If you got the information, put it in. Got the information, put it in. Okay, so... The way I look at the PMBOK guide, you know, is like those books that would say, choose your own adventure, and you would choose how the end of the story <laughs> ends. Some, sometimes you're, you're, you're the vic victor, and other times you're the victim, you know, jokes apart. The PMBOK guide is a choose your own adventure standard. You've got to choose what happens with whatever you use. So if you choose to put names in, like my buddy has done here, Oh, well, I'm good. I'm not going to say, oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't put names. You should put generic. No, no, no. That is minutia. And I can tell you the PMP exam is not going to be, you know, testing you on the intricate, oh, it should be generic or not. No. They will test you on what should be here. Resource needed. Whether it's a name, whether it's generic, you know, that's fine. So I wouldn't split hairs over that. Um, and then the next question I have here is... Um, if the cost based on the activity list, why is the activity list not an input to estimate cost? This is also another good question, and it's um, another place I would like to reinforce what you need to do as a student. So I'm going to show you the activity list before answering that question. So let's take a look at the activity list again that I showed. Here's an example of an activity list. Now, in reality, this list could be shorter. It may not contain as, you know, much detailed descriptions as I'm showing here. But the bottom line is it's a list. But the next question I have for you is what happens to the activity list? You need to follow through with the idea that the PMI is trying to float across. What happens to the activity list? Well, ultimately, your activity list is going to become part of voila your project schedule now we talked about the schedule last time and i know i showed it to you in smart sheets this is the schedule in ms project this time and when you talk about an activity list it's pretty much this list but wait this is the schedule so what am i trying to tell you i'm trying to tell you that the schedule contains your activity list you see what i'm saying so when you go to estimate cost 7.2 and you're looking for the activity list, you ain't going to find it. You're going to find something else. So let's read the details here. It says, under estimate cost, if you look at 7-4, what do you see? You see the cost management plan. You see the quality management plan. You see the scope baseline. You don't have a schedule baseline yet. You've got to remember that. And you look at project documents. What do you have? Lessons learned register. And what is number two item? Project schedule. So you don't have a schedule baseline, but 
you've got a project schedule. So what the PMI is trying to show you here is that the project schedule contains the list of activities. And that is what is going to be used to estimate costs for activities if you so need it. Now, going back to this whole dialogue about WBS, no WBS, and, you know, activity list and no activity list, let's take a quick read. Okay. So it says here under project documents, the schedule includes the type, quantity, and amount of time the team and physical resources will be active on the project. The duration estimates will affect cost estimates, when resources are charged per unit of time, and where there are seasonal fluctuations in cost. The schedule also provides useful information for projects that incorporate the cost of financing, including interest charges. So what does that tell you? It tells you, my friends, that there are times you're looking for a particular thing like an activity list, but you just need to look with a much wider view and you realize, oh, the activity list has become, by this time, part of your project schedule. So you don't need it. Okay? So thank you very much for those questions. Um, and I believe those were the questions that came in. And going back to our project schedule, this is pretty much where we left it last time. And I was telling you guys that in the world of scheduling, um, we can use different tools, we can do this in different ways, and this is where I will continue from. We're going to take a break here, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about the schedule, and then we'll talk more about cost, which that question that came in is actually leading us to. So thank you for joining me. We'll take a break here and then we'll come back and continue talking about scheduling. Bye for now.